So um, thank you for coming. There's a lot of you, which is surprising. Um, I actually wanted to get a sense of who's in the room because uh, I know the topic is kind of vague. And uh, I wanted to get a sense of who actually is a project manager here. Okay, cheaters, cheaters, you're not supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> who is a designer? Okay, developer. Okay, and how many of you work by yourself? Okay, cool. And uh, how many of you work w in an agency or a small team? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Sarah Rosso. Um, I work at uh, Automatic, which is uh, WordPress.com, some other things. And over the past few years, I've done, I've worn a lot of hats. Um, I'm currently director of marketing, but I have an unofficial title of getting stuff done. Um, mm -hmm. And I have taken like a lot of project management classes and, and um, over the years, and I just wanted to kind of share some of the, the principles, I think, between, between what project managers are trying to do and how maybe you perceive that <laughs> when you're trying to run a project or when someone is trying to run you to get a project done. So um, this is a conversation a little bit about that, how project management works and how it might affect your work and where you can kind of impact projects the most. So I just wanted to start with this quote. Uh, last year I gave a talk about WordPress agencies and kind of scaling up and I think that's something that's really important for the WordPress community is actually to get you people working alone to start working together and bigger so that we can get bigger clients and companies onto WordPress. They want size in a lot of ways. Um, and something that Matt said is that, you know, there's a lot of development and design talent, but then there's that second part of it, which is the softer skills, the project management work, the, the, the client interaction. Um, so when I made that presentation, um, I thought about this and I wanted to expand on it a little more. So what is project management? According to me, project management is problem solving on a deadline. Um, there's a lot more to it, obviously, but that's kind of the most important part is that you are trying to get something done by a certain date. Um, and luckily, I found a quote that brings us back to designers. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Oslo at a conference and Mike Montero was there. I'm not sure if you know who he is. And he said, designers are problem solvers. And he talked about how designers are not artists necessarily, but they also <laughs> take a problem and, and try, to, try to solve it. So there is a big tie between project management, I think, and, um, and what designers and, and, and developers do. So first, let's talk a little bit about spreadsheets. <laughs> OK, I get excited. Um, <laughs> so we use a lot of different tools to get things done, right? Designers use you know, design and actual, um, you know, maybe it's a user interface, maybe you're doing graphics. And for a project manager, a lot of time we're, we're spending time in, in spreadsheets. Um, like I said, I have a little bit of a problem with it. I'm going to show you something that probably not many people have seen. This is the Wayback Machine. I used to have a, a website called the Spreadsheet Warrior. And this is, I obviously can't see anything <laughs> anymore because there's no design. But basically it was just, it was just a landing page with quotes that had spreadsheet in it, um, like this one that says, uh, great works are performed not by strength, but by spreadsheet. And definitely Samuel Johnson did not say that. Um, so, <laughs> so this is a little bit about, I, I really like spreadsheets. And the other thing that you know, project managers love are Gantt charts. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever seen that before. Um, you, you might be lucky if you haven't. And uh, just a little closer look at it, just, so many beautiful things to fill out and tables and um, <laughs> it's, it, it kind of brings a calm to me. Um, but we're not going to talk about those things today. What I wanted to talk a little bit about today is the project management triangle. Um, it has some other fun names like the iron triangle or the triple constraint. Um, but let's kind of focus on the simple name that you'll remember. And that is talking about cost, schedule, and scope. Okay, and these are the three things that put pressure on a project during its entirety, right? Um, and the, co the project manager is constantly trying to balance those things, right? And to, in the middle, keep the quality um, good and stable. And uh, today we're going to focus on just scope and schedule. If you're lucky, you never have to see cost. <laughs> and hopefully, I think that's why 
you're not in business development or in account management because you're not interested in that. And for quality, I'm sure you're getting other sessions here that are going to help you do something um, that has a lot of quality. So let's talk a little bit about scope. Um, the project scope is about the entire project, right? What needs to get done, how it needs to get done. Um, for example, we could use a WordCamp as an example. Um, they wanted to have it maybe sometime in the fall, and they had to get a team together, et cetera. If you step back a, a, a step from most of your projects, something that you may not have visibility into is the business reasons for that, right? If someone says they want to launch a website, that's not really the reason. Usually it's because they want to generate sales, they want to, maybe they want to save infrastructure costs by hosting it somewhere else, they need to get out of uh, proprietary software into WordPress, and you know, that means that there are some underlying reasons. And it's actually really important for the project manager to know these things uh, because then they can kind of gauge the solution that they're going to be proposing. So the project scope is about the entire project, what needs to get done. And inside of that, what you guys probably spend most of your time on is the product scope, right? So actually what's going into the website, how's it going to look, what are the technical specifications? And there are some peripheral things around the product, like maybe you need to register a domain name or you know, actually design the logo first or um, get hosting. So if we want to talk a little bit more about, um, sorry about that. So in an ideal world, what's an ideal world? <laughs> you might have something like waterfall. So you have a discovery process, and you're part of that, and you actually get to understand you know, the information being shared, what the business reasons are. You are part of the planning and the strategy, architecting that solution. You collaborate and execute that solution, and then you deliver it, right? And in reality, a lot of projects skip steps. Uh, maybe some things are decided before you actually get to the project or by the time you've been involved that you are kind of jumping somewhere here in the middle, maybe someone abandoned the project, right, and you're picking up the pieces. Um, just for fun, let's talk a little bit about agile development here. Um, if you're building sites, you're probably, I don't know if anyone's using agile development in building a website. Um, if you're in it for the long term, maybe if you're going to be supporting that site for years, on WordPress.com we do a little bit more of this because the platform is being tweaked even several times a day, sometimes dozens of times a day. Um, but again, this is the ideal situation, right? Now the real world. Um, <laughs> So again, it's a lot messier on VIP for years. Sometimes we would end up uh, with the client showing up already with the deadline. And they would say, and this is the solution that we've chosen. And if you're lucky enough, you can work backwards with them to actually impact the, the strategy there. So that's when your scope is in danger, right? When you have skipped some steps, when, when business requirements are being forced upon you where you can't actually impact the solution, right? They're saying we need it on this platform with, by this date, um, and hopefully you don't have to deal with the cost, but that's, that's mm -hmm. usually a problem as well. And scope creep is like the, the worst thing that can happen to projects. It's hard to predict um, and resolve. If you haven't spent enough time on the business requirements, then it's really easy for projects to get out of control. And if they've made a commitment to an external launch date, that usually can be a really big problem for you. You might have to make concessions on features or functionality just to hit those dates. So you might not have an ideal situ situation and you might ha not have the specifications. So I think that these are five good questions to kind of step back and, and actually ask yourself at one point. So what, what do I know, right? Kind of assessing all the information that they've given you. What do I not know? And this seems like a really obvious question. It's actually a question we often don't ask ourselves because we say, okay, this is the information we have. Let's move forward and stop and say, what actually is missing from this? Um, and this is really important actually for everybody on the team to do that. So if your project manager gives you content, they say, this is what we know, it's a really good idea for you to say, well, what about this or this? Um, what are their expectations? Okay. And when I was working um, in the agency world, uh, one of the, my favorite things that we started to do is actually saying, 
what are we not expecting to do? So we would actually list it out and say, hey, we're not going to be doing this, 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 and this. Because again, it's, it's something that you assume is clear to the other party and often they are expecting you to do it. And that's when later in the project and they say, why didn't you do this or this, this? Um, and again, am I assuming or have I actually asked? Um, so this gets back to documentation and actually making sure things are clear in terms of requirements. So let's talk a little bit about schedule. This is usually my favorite part of a project because then I have to figure out how all of the pieces work together and how they'll fit on a timeline. And that's when you get things like spreadsheets and, and Gantt charts. But let's take a step back for a second. You know, usually Gantt charts are only done in project management software. I've ported a few to spreadsheets by hand and I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, but the important things to extract from the Gantt chart are two, the critical path and dependencies. So we're going to talk about that. So let's go back to our project. You remember that we defined the scope of the project. And um, you know it, vaguely what it's going to look like at the end of the project, but we should start breaking it up into pieces. So right now it looks, it looks like a big blob. But then pretty much every task can be broken up into smaller pieces, right? And that's something that that I've applied to pretty much everything in my life. When um, you know, someone asks me, why are you moving to Italy? How are you doing that? You, know, you start to break it up into pieces. So you need tickets to find housing, or sorry, you need, <clears throat> you need to find your housing, you need to buy a plane ticket, you, know, you need to network and, and find a job. So that goes the same for most project work. When you have something that feels very undefined, you have to start chopping it up into pieces that feel more tangible and more attainable. Um, so then we can start to take things and group them, you know, and put a little bit of order to them. Um, for simplicity, some of the larger tasks are larger, some of the smaller tasks are, are smaller. I kind of know the order, perhaps, in which they need to be done. Um, time's running at the top here. And then what is starts to get interesting is when I see that there are dependencies between things, right? So this can't get started until that finishes. Etc. knowing where the inputs and outputs of the project are. So now you're working on your tasks, but maybe you have to interface with the content people or with um, someone who's giving you assets. You know, it's really uh, interesting for you to see where in this you fit. And the most uh, interesting thing about it is once you figure out where the dependencies are, are then to figure out what the critical path is. Um, the critical path is basically the longest path of the project. So from start to finish, I can't go any faster than this because this is dependent on that, that's dependent on that, and all of these things have their time and their place that needs to get done. As a project manager, I am obsessing over the critical path, right? Because if any of these things move, my project, the whole project moves, okay? And it's really cool for you to kind of know where you are in the path, right? Um, so something that every person on the team should kind of be aware of is, OK, if I'm preparing the data structure for the content migration, like we can't do the content migration until we have the custom post types or whatever has to be there first um, to go in there. And that's something, if someone is waiting for your output on the critical path as well, any time that you're late or that you aren't delivering on time, you're going to affect the whole, the whole thing. So your role can be really helpful in knowing which of your activities are critical and also communicating that back to uh, your project manager when maybe it seems like something isn't going right. So this is kind of what the PM is doing on a continual basis, is like flying over the project and seeing how the pieces are fitting together and who's late and who's going to make, you know, where we're going to have to make up time later. So if there's one thing that I'd like you to take away from today, it's just pick a date. <laughs> um, one of the most frustrating things for project managers working on a project if you're lucky enough not to have a client. So some of you, if you're doing product work or you have maybe kind of a flexible uh, release date is starting to put dates around things. Um, and a lot of the things that we do in automatic and even um, just like new things, if we haven't, we are not ready to estimate them yet. We don't know exactly how long this site takes or that feature takes. Sometimes just picking a date into the far enough future 
um, a kind of an arbitrary future in a way helps because then you work backwards from that, right? You can work backwards from that and then also you can prioritize things as that gets nearer. So it can be really frustrating when, when there's no sense of urgency. And um, if you have trouble picking a date on something, like if maybe I, I give you two weeks to get something done and I need you to give me a date and you're unable to do that, probably you haven't defined the, the task well enough yet, right? It's too nebulous, it's too, um, so you need to go back, you need to go back and chunk it up into better pieces where you can say, okay, well, I know that the logo is gonna take three days and then I need an approval for two days and then I could do reworks and you can start to kind of list that out. Um, in software planning, I would say that, I don't know, I think, I don't know if there's a rule of three, but maybe three X for planning. So usually if the developer says it's two hours, I put in six. Um, you know, or, and I know that he's probably doing it in half an hour, <laughs> but um, it's really important to kind of make sure that you're keeping an eye on how much you're padding things. Uh, and if you're picking dates consistently and not, and not hitting them, that's a good thing to go back and look at. And that's where we come to blockers. So um, one of the questions that I ask frequently is what's blocking you, okay? And um, it's pretty self-explanatory if you're waiting for someone to give you something or something's unclear, that's gonna block you from getting the work done. And uh, that's the first thing I'm gonna ask if if you're not delivering something. Um, it's actually pretty easy at a high level, again, as a project manager, to kind of see maybe where the blocks are. At the individual level, it's probably a lot harder. So you, yourself, having trouble maybe, I don't know, finishing the data structure or something, you need to step back for a second and see like what, what really is blocking me? Do I not have enough information? Do I not, um, maybe I need someone else to look at it so I feel better about it, and that's kind of a good time for you to see how you're not bringing the, the work forward. And then that brings us back to communicating, which is, um, again, most project managers pad time into their schedules, and they may not tell you that, but I just told you, so shh. Um, <laughs> they ask for you to do something maybe on Tuesday, but on the critical path, they really need it by Wednesday. And if you know that something is going to be slipping, I talked about this earlier, um, or, or could be faster, that's always really helpful. Managing expectations, I think, is one of the best things that you can do. <laughs> so managing expectations is actually one of the best things that you can do. Um, manage them back up to your project manager and to your team so that they can feel that like, okay, I'm working on that, but I'm gonna need another half a day or something. So communicate, communicate. We say communication is oxygen. It's just like, it's really necessary. So let's get back to our, ooh, got bigger, scope creep. Scope is getting bigger now. Um, now that we've understood a little bit more about schedules and about scope, let's talk about how you have some direct impact on that. So if it's well-defined, there still may, may be some worries that you can have. Has anyone ever heard of gold plating? Ooh, okay, yeah, we you raise your, okay, good. Um, gold plating, gold plating is adding features uh, which are nice to have but unnecessary and not requested by the client. Who's ever done something because they just think it'll make it that much better? Okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so gold plating is really adding unnecessary things that are not requested. Um, that doesn't mean you can't add or propose new features, but that circles back to the business reasons, right? If you know what the business reasons are for this, for this project, then, then your, your things make sense. If you're putting like a bevel or like some sort of flyover um, action on a button, it doesn't really add up to them getting more sales, that's one thing. So um, if your features are directly related to business reasons, it's gonna make a lot more sense and hopefully your project manager can work that back into the original scope. So. Gold plating usually has good intentions behind it, but try and stop yourself <laughs> um, if you really don't know how it's contributing to the project. Another way you can avoid scope creep is by um, making sure the, pro the project has phases of rollouts. That's one of the th phases and milestones, which I, I'm sure most of you are using, but it, it's always good to remember. And, and often it's good to get the client to buy in on that. So you can bring it back to them and say, hey, this is what we're proposing for phase one, phase two. This is what we think should be online by launch. These are the features we wanna add after launch. 
And that will help kind of prioritize some of the features and functionality in this kind of agreement and also make sure that you're not just adding and adding and adding for launch. Um, this, I pretty much don't need to say anything about this. <laughs> like, we definitely need to make sure that you're documenting everything. Um, a lot of the conversations, and, and if you'll see people taking notes, you know, the project manager usually during client meetings, during your talks, are just furiously taking notes because it is good to have a reference. It's good to say, well, this is what we agreed upon. Um, if you're working alone, you, and I've actually worked with a couple of freelancer designers recently, and, and I'm sure at some point they're frustrated because we're, we're doing things back and forth. We didn't agree on them initially, but we didn't agree on anything initially. We just said, oh, let's just go. And that's the problem when you know, it just helps you to kind of document. Um, so if you're not used to that, maybe you, you can start recording phone calls <laughs> and taking out notes from that. Um, sending some sort of recap after every client interaction is going to be really helpful because, again, that will go back to the assumptions. Well, I assumed when I said this, you understood that. Um, and you can maybe say, no, well, this is how I understood it. So um, a few more things which are, aren't less important, but it's really hard to cover in such a short time. Um, resource allocation. Uh, if you're working solo, you are your resource to allocate. <laughs> and you're going to have to understand how many clients that you can take on at the same time. Um, and if you're working with a team, that's when the magic starts to happen with trying to make sure that the critical path of each project is being respected and things are moving forward. Um, hopefully you don't have to really deal with this too much, but it is something to think about. We, we have seen with, with um, partner agencies or, or people that we work with that the quality is really high when they have one or two projects. When they get to three or four or five, they haven't figured out resource allocation, they haven't hired new people, then the quality starts going down. So that's something as you're growing and you're getting better um, that you might need some help. You might need more people to, to work with you on stuff. Risk planning. Risk planning can take a lot of forms and depending on the project it can be it can be even, you know, client data or user data that's a risk that you have to deal with. But in this this situation I would say the, the biggest risk is, is yourself. Again, if you're your own resource, um, taking a vacation, getting sick for a day is, is actually a big deal. Um, as a project manager, I'm worried that you're the only person who knows what's going on. And then you, you leave or, or, you, or you get sick. I mean, it, it happens, right? So this goes back to documenting everything and making sure that you're not the only, you're not the, like, the, the failover. There's other people that can pick up the work that you're working on. Um, approvals, this again relates back to getting everything documented, um, making sure that your project manager is happy with your work and that you get them to sign off on something. So again, this, this also relates back to the scope creep, right? At some point, like, and I'm as a project manager, I'm like, well, just, just fix that real quick and just do that and just do that. And I've had people go, wait, 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 like, well, this is our launch date. Like, are you happy? And then everything else will roll into a V2. So um, don't be afraid to to also push back, get, get dates, and kind of make, make them agree, like what, what is critical that has to go in by this date. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to share. And um, I'm curious for questions and who's in the audience and what you guys were hoping to get from this. But go ahead and let me know. Thank you. Any questions? Uh oh. Yes. <laughs> Front row. Um, when you when you have oh Casper, we know him. Hi Casper. When, um, when you have a situation where you notice that an agency that you work with or a partner that you work with actually have problems with uh, resource allocation, what's how how do you talk to them about that? Yeah. What, what, what what do you do about that? What's what's the way you approach that or? Well. So in, in VIP's experience specifically, so I'm not on the team. Well, yeah, and it, well, I mean, okay, the, the best thing is obviously you need to have a constant conversation with them to see how things are going. That's out, like, stepping back from that specific project, from the overall, how is hiring going? Are they looking for people? Trying to see, I mean, we've, we've had people who tell us they have too much work, and that's actually a really scary step for some people to turn down work, but it's, it, it's uh, something that gets respected at the same time. And, 
And that's actually in my other presentation when I started to talk about um, don't lose a client, create a partnership. So at that point, that might be something where you, you two work together and you say, hey, like, we only have uh, some design resources. Do you guys have a developer? And let's work together. And you can continue to, to keep like, that momentum going, maybe. Um, so that's really, you really want to kind of keep checking in with them. Um, usually, code quality is going down if people aren't, um, they're not doing reviews. Like, so if what we've seen in the past that the code gets to you and like easy mistakes or things that probably should have been fixed because maybe a senior person isn't able to do the checks they were doing before. Um, so I don't know, always be hiring really <laughs> is, the, is the key there. Question? Um, about gold plating. Uh -oh. uh, I, had, <laughs> I mean, of course I'm a developer sometimes. I do that because I think, oh, it would be nice to have this feature or make it easier to work with. But how do you, uh, you explain phases? Mm -hmm. um, what if like phase one and phase two is clear and you know it's going to be a long-term partnership mm -hmm. and you're already thinking about phase three or, or four, but um, you are not sure yet how your code needs to evolve to incorporate that? Is there so that would get back to the business reasons, which hopefully if they've set out what the business reasons are, Depending on how, how far ahead you want to do, like obviously is, has V1 launched yet? How, can they measure, like are they happy? Like did, yeah. did it do the things that they said they would do? Have the business reasons changed in the meantime? Maybe they're like, okay, now we're going to optimize for speed because whoops, you know, like the sales have gone up but actually the site's slow or something. So I think you have to have those conversations on a regular basis with your client and, and you have to do it in that, I think in that way too and just say like, hey, we're starting to plan for V3. We want to get a check in on where your business is, how you're feeling with things, has there been any, any new things that have come up where they're now a higher priority? And then you adjust from that. So um, being a part of those conversations is a big deal. And that's when you become a partner and not just like a, a vendor. I don't know if that makes sense. And that's, that's a, definitely for VIP, that's something that we, we always, we don't want to be seen as a vendor, we want to be seen as a partner. And I think everybody here, they don't want someone to come to them and say, build me a WordPress site. They want you to, you know, you want to be a part of that s solution. Like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? And, you know, try and figure out. I had a conversation with um, a big newspaper in Italy. And um, they're like, we need to use BuddyPress. We need to use BuddyPress. I'm like, OK, well, let's back up a second. Like, what are you actually trying to do? And like, one of the big things that they wanted was like author pages. And I was like, well, that's part of core WordPress. And I was like, do you want people to like follow authors or interact with them? He's like, no, we just want pages. And I was like, well, that's part of core WordPress. So I mean, just kind of making sure that the assumptions that they have about what they need, that's something I go over and over uh, on with, um, especially with certain plugins and everyone's just like, I need this plugin for my WordPress site or I'm gonna die or it's, you know, it's not gonna be a success. That was part of my, <laughs> no really, I, when we do booths at you know, blogger conferences and stuff, people come up in a panic because they're not, they're not able to install something or, you know, and I go, wait, what are you trying to do? Um, if you're interested in that, actually, I, I, my last presentation in September was just about that and it's aimed at end users. And basically, it's focusing on um, like content and purpose. And I was like, if you don't know what those two things are, nothing, no, no plugin is going to help you. Um, so, so yeah, being a part of that conversation on a regular basis about the business reasons and what's kind of changing is really, really helpful. Thank you. Hi, front row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, uh, my current situation is I work on products, so I don't have a client's clients. Uh, but um, I do kind of maintenance work, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of uh, pieces of work that are not quite connected to release schedule. Okay. So there is no... So you have trouble no picking a date? Date pressure. No, that's not, that's not the question. Okay. So there is no uh, pressure of date. And I am given, luckily for me, a lot of autonomy to what specific work to do. And my approach, uh, my current approach is I started on, I do what I call roadmaps. Mm -hmm. So on GitHub, I create an issue, I call it roadmap for a thing. Mm -hmm. And I do like step by step, like what I see. And you create milestones that. around that then? or No, not tied to milestones. Okay. Uh, so my question is, 
what do I need to pay attention to keep like management people happy about that? Milestones. <laughs> 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 My first thing would be like, okay, so how do you? I in think sense of dates or well, in sense of uh, phases. Both. Both. Absolutely, everything, yes. Everything both. Yeah, schedule and scope, right? That's for me. I want to be. I want to say, okay, how are you prioritizing? That's. I mean, that's really the important word. How do? You, how are you deciding what's most important here? Okay, that's. That must be phase one, unless it's dependent on something else later. And then, yeah, when can I? When can I see that? How quickly? How quickly are you going to do it? So break it out, not just like single list, but break it out by sections. Like. Yeah, and I think if you start to look at how you have this huge roadmap and you can start to break it into pieces and figure out like maybe something can't be done until six months later until you've fixed these six things, so you know? I kind of, so that's kind of built in already. I already okay. write it in like, uh, not in arbitrary, I okay. already write in like semi-chronological order okay. that I need to do this and then that and then that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, I think, I think on GitHub, some I see a lot of people are are organizing around milestones. I think that's really helpful because at least if someone is stumbling upon your work and looking, they're like, oh, why isn't this issue being worked on? And they can see it's not part of the milestone that's coming up now, too, that in some ways it answers their question for them, that they know you've decided this is not a near-term priority. So I don't know. It's good to, I think it just documenting and sharing everything is just better, just to tell people what you're going to be doing. So that's what I would do. OK, thank you. OK, question? Do you have a good tool to recommend for the critical path and their milestone? You can do it on a piece of paper, to be honest. Okay, but like an online tool? No, I mean, really, I mean, it's just, it's literally breaking, I mean, the, I'm going to say spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> 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 well, I mean, that's, I, that's what I do with a lot of things is I, I do start in spreadsheets because then you can move things around really easy and, you know, if you're not doing a piece of paper. But um, I start with the, the biggest, the biggest circles. And then under those, I have sub things and, and start to break those out. And then I arrange those into order because maybe I can't print the name tags until I have the final name, name list or something. So um, that's probably where I would start. I would start in a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'd probably go to a spreadsheet just, just for organization's sake. Otherwise, if you want, there are some open source uh, project management tools. They're um, probably a little too much for what you, I mean, what you really need to be doing. Because then you start getting into like, you know, really actually setting up Gantt charts and stuff, which are fun, but um, <laughs> but maybe a little too much. So I'd probably just do it in a spreadsheet, just because then you can drag and drop and move stuff around really easily. Yeah, question? Yeah, actually, I'm interested in the Gantt chart, because okay. you, you can put the dependencies in there. If yes. How does that work? Of course, I can find something online about it. But yeah, um, I think one I was using is OpenProj, I think. It's it's a little rough, you know, because that's <coughs> it. But hey, we love our open source. Um, <laughs> Basically, what you're going to be doing is there's going to be a column there that says um, it'll say like priority or dependency, and basically, like you'll say, task number 17 is dependent on four. So when and it'll immediately like throw it where the end of, of four is. So you'll just put in what the dependencies are in a column. Duration. Yeah. So you might say this task. Is, I estimate this task to be five days. And it'll immediately put out five days. And then you have to have a start date somewhere, right? You have to start somewhere. And then it'll start to, you just tell it if, where the dependencies are. Okay. Yeah, and the order. Okay, cool. What's the name again? I think um, OpenProj, P-R-O-J, I think is the one that I was using. But Microsoft Project has one. Um, I think there's some other ones. Merlin, for us. What's that? Merlin. Merlin? OK. Oh, really cool, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, see, we have some people in the audience who are here to spy. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? OK. Oh, one, two, OK, two way. Sorry. I was actually asking like, what kind of PM software are you using, but actually we don't really use a PM software to. Not right now. Do I don't even know if I can say this on, on, on the camera. Because, because um, the output is not as appreciated in my company as it is for me. So I usually just want something that can be shared. And, and like if I'm, if I'm doing something in project management software, probably the rest of my team doesn't have it. So I can send them a PDF, or I can just try and do something in a spreadsheet or something that is easier. So it just depends on the project. Right now, I'm not doing, I'm not doing these huge critical projects where I did like 
I did like ISO 9001 certification. No. When, yeah, <laughs> when I was in Milan, uh, and so we did all the documentation stuff. So that was something big that I that I would want to have. But I think it depends. You have to have something that's easy for you, but it has to be something that the rest of your team will use. Otherwise, you're kind of just throwing stuff at them. So anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.